in use literally and metaphorically uh, in the area of uh, uh, disorders like chronic cough, uh, not only identifying the causes, but uh, also developing programs that uh, help these kids. Uh, so it is uh, something that uh, we see very, very often, especially this uh, past year. And um, it is uh, great to hear from uh, the person who has done probably the most uh, work uh, in this uh, area. I would also like to comment Dr. Weinberger because uh, from what I understand, he's in California, which means that he had to get up uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning in order to be uh, with us uh, today. So this is an extra sacrifice. So, Miles, thank you very much for joining us, and uh, Mr. Butner, um, and we are ready for your talk. Thank you, Tezas. Uh, uh, you, you kind of gave away my age by telling me you were a fellow when you first met me. And <laughs> but. Uh, I started really very good. early. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so this is the presentation, Functional Respiratory Disorders in Children. And for those of you who uh, uh, haven't yet uh, received this uh, uh, publication, which just came out, uh, if you want a PDF file, feel free to uh, email me and I'll be happy to uh, give you one. Uh, so functional respiratory disorders are those which have no organic or anatomical basis. Uh, and uh, they tend to uh, uh, cause diagnostic problems uh, uh, for physicians and uh, as a result, patients get treated for a lot of things that they don't have. Uh, physicians uh, treat for things that they know, um, and uh, sometimes it's left up to the patient to figure out what really is going on. So I have no conflicts of interest regarding this topic. So what are the functional respiratory disorders? They include habit cough, vocal cord dysfunction, of which there are two uh, phenotypes, exercise-induced and spontaneous, <clears throat> hyperventilation, which is also uh, both exercise-induced and uh, associated with panic attacks, uh, and then there's functional dyspnea and uh, sighing disorder. And I'll go through those. Some of them take more time than others. And we'll start off with habit cough. And if we're going to talk about habit cough, uh, I think it's important to put it into perspective with overall chronic cough. And this was a beautiful study done by Annie Chang's group from Brisbane, Australia, a multi center study on chronic cough in children. Uh, etiologies based on a standardized management pathway. And uh, this uh, setting was Australia and New Zealand at five major hospitals, three rural remote clinics. So these were referred patients, referred to patients now. Uh, 346 children referred for chronic cough. Chronic cough in children is defined as more than four weeks duration. In adults, it is to avoid can, uh, people might uh, be confused by this, uh, but adults is defined as more than eight weeks. These are somewhat artificial definitions. Uh, the mean age of this group was 4.5 years. And here's what they came up with. Now, I'm not going to go through all of these. That would be a separate presentation. Uh, what we're going to do is focus on the uh, what they called habitual cough or what I call a half a cough, and that was 4% uh, of, uh, of, of this identified uh, 346 uh, patients. What are the characteristics of the habit cough? And we'll also go into where it gets its name. Um, 
the classical clinical characteristics are a repetitive dry barking cough. Uh, it's, the, the cough is, it tends to be very annoying to people. Uh, it's much too bold usually to prevent school attendance. Uh, but there are variations, they're not all the same and I'll be showing you some of those. Uh, it's commonly misdiagnosed as asthma, although it, it shouldn't be because uh, it really doesn't have any resemblance to asthma from my point of view. But uh, cough from asthma is something that physicians know, so they treat that. Uh, uh, but there is no response to medication. And a sine qua non, is the absence once asleep, a very important part of the characteristic and this it's uh, uh, to, uh, and very important for identifying whether or not a chronic cough is, uh, that is a repetitive dry cough is whether or not it's present or absent during sleep. The epidemiology of habit cough uh, uh, comes from uh, two studies. Uh, one is uh, one in Iowa where we had 140 uh, patients over a 20 year period. And that was a mean of seven per year. Uh, and at the Brompton Hospital in London, uh, they identified the patients exactly the same way we did. Uh, and they found 55 over six years. And that was a mean of nine per year. So that gives you uh, seven to nine per year is about what you could expect at a uh, major referral center like the Brompton or the University of Iowa. The mean age at both places was 10 years, both genders are represented, uh, and the cough could be present for weeks, months, and even years. Uh, and again, the diagnosis at both places was the same way, repetitive cough, absent during sleep. There are no tests involved and uh, some reviews in the past have said, well, you have to, to diagnose it, you have to exclude all other known causes of cough. That is nonsense. Okay? It has its own, this is a characteristic presentation. Uh, so it's a clinical diagnosis. And uh, that was exactly how the Brompton uh, did it and that's how we did it. Uh, secondary gain is not commonly present and psychopathology is not commonly present. So let's look at the, uh, uh, these are home videos that parents provided uh, to my colleague, uh, Dennis Butner, who's with us also. Uh, the, um, uh, and he put it together and um, uh, we have, as I remember, I think five different home videos uh, linked together here to show you uh, the uh, different types of cough. And particularly, uh, I, I th I'd like you to pay attention to the second one I'm going to show you uh, because uh, it, the cough is rather subtle and you have to watch and, and listen carefully. That's how you do the game. Uh, you get that cough. You want me to be Spider Man? Watch, yeah, watch be Spider -Man. Okay, you'll be Spider Man, I'll be Spider Man, and we'll fight the bad guys. Is that a good uh, idea? There's another cough. Fist bump. Fist bump. No, no, slap, slap, slap. Okay, slap, slap. Nice, bud. Okay, now where we go? That was another cough. So at least once a minute, okay, he's uh, not a good cough. <laughs> I'll introduce these afterwards. <laughs> Okay. 
So I'm moving on uh, because uh, uh, we have time for everything. Emily is British, even though this she's living in Spain. <laughs> now, Abby in Australia has been doing this for five years since age 10. And right now she's listening to, uh, to me, uh, to a recording of me talking to uh, Mr. Butner's uh, daughter, Bethany. And you'll hear more, you'll see more of that later. Mm -hmm. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. That's all right. Well, fix it up. <laughs> okay, so that was a demonstration of uh, that she was starting to have uh, from listening to that uh, progressive periods of time between the repetitive coughs. So those were examples of uh, habit cough in children. And you see, the, the number of them had the classic, very harsh you know, barking cough. Uh, uh, others uh, were like the little three-year-old, which is the youngest one we've seen, who coughs every uh, second uh, into his uh, elbow, uh, but uh, uh, doesn't let it bother him. So, uh, how do we treat habit cough? Well, it was first described, at least the, the oldest one uh, that uh, uh, Dennis Butner found for me, uh, was described in 1694. Uh, and uh, it, it fits what we very often get a history of today. Uh, they talked about the habitual cough which often continues after the first cough, which was caused by a cold. The cold is gone, uh, but then the uh, cough, uh, the habitual cough continues. And that's a very common history uh, that uh, the vast majority of both kids and adults uh, describe. Uh, they had some respiratory illness uh, and uh, uh, I've heard parents say, well, they had an ordinary cough and then after a couple of weeks, the cough changed and became this habit cough. So what do you do about it uh, for um, uh, poor guy here? Uh, doesn't know what to do. And unfortunately, a lot of physicians don't know what to do either. Uh, but it has been described and treated since 1966 and also in 1984, 1991. Uh, I'm going to go through those cases uh, because uh, they're informative. So uh, this first uh, study from 1966 was Bernard Berman, a uh, Boston averagist who unfortunately is no longer with us. Uh, he described six children that he'd seen over a five-year period with a daily barking cough. 
uh, frequent, uh, and uh, and he 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 noticed that he, he described it as being frequent, repetitive, and absent once asleep. Again, the characteristic ages were between nine and thirteen, boys and girls, uh, and he described that these coughing, these children, these six children, uh, the cough stopped with what he called in his article, the art of suggestion. Uh, he also discussed the nomenclature uh, for this uh, because uh, there have been previous reports, uh, uh, isolated case reports that some people would call psychogenic or a tick. Uh, uh, but he felt the term habit cough was most appropriate based on his observation and the ease with which he was able to cure them. Uh, another uh, method that was used uh, and reported in 1984 by Cohen and Stone was what was called the bed sheet. And then there was another one that came out with it was called alternative to the bed sheet. And I'll go through these quickly. Uh, the uh, bed sheet technique uh, was uh, based on um, the uh, physician telling the patient that the coughing had caused weakness of their uh, chest wall and the wrapping the bed sheet around it uh, tightly uh, would strengthen it and uh, enable them to stop coughing. So uh, uh, this again was a form of suggestion uh, but using a uh, physical, uh, a, a not quite truthful physical means of stopping them. Uh, however, he described 33 children treated this way over 25 years. And then with a follow-up, he said 31 were successful. Very nice study. Uh, the uh, alternative to the bed sheet uh, was because uh, these physicians didn't like that it was an aversive technique. And uh, uh, they described four children who they treated just by having the parents monitor the cough and rewarding them for making the cough less frequent. The first study we did was in 1991. Uh, and uh, the index case that um, led to the study was a 15 year old girl with months of intractable cough. A very nice young lady, uh, did well in school, had lots of friends, uh, was uh, uh, obviously upset. Uh, and as uh, had been done with many patients over the previous uh, 20 years, since I'd been in Iowa since 1975, uh, uh, I stopped the cough with 15 minutes of suggestion therapy. Uh, Dr. Lakshin, uh, Boris Lakshin was my fellow at the time, and he was very impressed. It was first time I'd seen. And so he asked, is the quick fix permanent? And so the natural thing for me to do was to tell Dr. Lakshin, find out. And uh, so we had my nurse do a, this was before electronic medical records, uh, had my nurse, Jean Kovach, uh, do a manual review of clinical charts and uh, found nine patients with habit cough. And uh, uh, they were six to 17 years old. Uh, and uh, they were routinely contacted a week after the initial suggestion therapy. And uh, one of them uh, had no symptoms. Eight described uh, minor self-controlled symptoms. Uh, that is, they needed no further medical care. They were able to control their cough. Uh, uh, Dr. Lakshin was able to contact seven of the nine, an average of 2.2 years later in those. Uh, uh, one of them was much longer, I think almost nine years afterwards. Uh, and six of those uh, seven that he was able to contact had no symptoms. Uh, one of them described minor self-controlled symptoms. Uh, uh, another investigator in this was uh, Dr. Lindgren, who was a clinical psychologist in our department who gave them a standardized test called the SCL90R, which is designed to look for somaticization uh, and other abnormal behaviors. And they found no abnormalities. Uh, uh, one uh, had a borderline uh, obsessive compulsive scale 
but uh, uh, but not clearly in the uh, range of abnormal. Uh, uh, probably just in the range that you'd expect maybe from a good physician. Uh, you want someone, uh, so, but it was not pathological. So uh, how did we treat the patients? Uh, uh, and uh, we decided to take a look at this and uh, this report in 2016 uh, at the cough without a cause, uh, the habit cough syndrome. Uh, the, um, we had these 140 patients. Uh, the, um, uh, that this time we identified the diagnosis through our electronic medical record over a 20 year period from 1995 to 2014. Mean age was 10 years, uh, range was four to 18 years. Uh, the three year old you saw in the video that was uh, not part of the study, uh, but it uh, made him the youngest we've ever seen. Uh, the coughing was actually observed in 85 of them during the clinic visit. In other words, some of them during the clinic visit didn't happen to be coughing, but had very convincing histories of uh, uh, consistent with habit cough. So 81 of those 85 were cured within 15 to 30 minutes of suggestion therapy by the clinic physician. These were not all done with me. Uh, the, this was whichever one of our staff uh, was seeing the patient was expected to do that, and uh, they did. Uh, auto suggestion, which is um, describing to the patient what we would have done if you weren't if you were coughing when we saw you. Uh, we talked to uh, those with a convincing history, uh, but weren't coughing in the clinic. And uh, well, we didn't do a systematic. Uh, uh, follow-up of those patients, uh, uh, the non-systematic follow-up we did have with quite a number of the patients uh, indicated that it was uh, effective. This is from our study, again, the same 140. This is uh, uh, what the, pri uh, gives you information about what the prior duration of the habit cough was. Uh, and uh, uh, some of them, of course, if they were uh, so obvious that the, the, the parents sought help from it uh, during the first month that they were having symptoms, but then there were an equal number who had been having the cough for over a year. So uh, what is this uh, suggestion therapy? So this is... The, video. the repetitive barking cough that is not present once the child is asleep is the diagnostic criterion. So this was done by Dennis Butner, the father of the girl you're going to see me with. And I'm going to move it along so that we can finish within the hour. Went on for three months, obviously difficult to live with. Hi, I'm Bethany. I'm 12 years old. I could do anything any kid could do before my cough. When I couldn't stop coughing, it made me really sad. Dr. Weinberger taught me how to make my cough go away in only 10 minutes. <laughs> I told you, right? The total number? No, no, no. I'm sure it's 1,200. I plan on recording art. I'm going to move this up a little bit. And I began to film because no one would believe what we were about to see. Great girl. You've done it. Over three minutes. Hey. <coughs> once you cough once, try not to let it happen again. <coughs> try over over back. Because you did it for over three minutes. 
and it'll get a little bit easier that time. Mm -hmm. Still hard though, huh? Okay, hey, we're gonna go for four minutes now. Now yeah. this is her, okay. her laptop. Yeah, doing it. Yeah, I'm talking to you in three minutes before you cough. Mm -hmm. So I bet you can do four minutes too. Because you're taking control. You're not letting it control you. So this is what you have to keep doing. You may have to do it for a while. It's going to gradually get easier. It gradually gets easier. So this was the uh, general idea. Uh, I was talking to Bethany in exactly the same way that I talked with over a 40 year period in Iowa, you know, probably hundreds of kids. Uh, uh, colleagues might have had you know, slightly different styles, uh, but we, we were quite reliable when stopping the, uh, the cough. Uh, uh, the principles here are, uh, uh, you approach to, for, for any of you who are going to, uh, and any one of you who are going to see children with habit cough should be able to stop it in the same way that I did, I and my colleagues have done, and other physicians, you know, uh, all over the world. Uh, so you approach the patient. Uh, oops, starting again. I don't want that. The repetitive barking cough that is not present once the child is asleep. Okay. So you approach the child uh, with the mantra from Yoda from Star Wars. Do or do not. There is no try. Sometimes someone says, well, try it. No, you don't try it. Uh, you approach it from the point of view, you're going to do it. And if you're not going to have that attitude, then don't bother. There, as Yoda said, there is no try. Uh, and what you, and this is just a, a excerpted uh, of uh, the verbal pattern, which is not always the same but a progressively holding back the cough uh, using sips of warm water to tell them to it's to ease the irritation. Uh, we started out using um, uh, a, uh, a saline mist, uh, normal saline mist. Uh, these are um, alternative behaviors. Uh, some people get the idea, well, what's the water treatment? No, it's not a water treatment, okay? The water is, uh, uh, to support what you're talking to them about. And uh, along the way, you start telling them it's getting easier to suppress the cough, isn't it? And at which time you nod affirmatively and they generally say yes. So again, a suggestion. Uh, when the suppressed cough is observed, you tell them you're feeling you can resist the urge to cough, aren't you? And again, an affirmative nod. And after five minutes without coughing, uh, you say you feel that you can now resist the urge to cough, and that's when you stop. So that was the first time uh, that I had ever done it uh, by uh, remote video conferencing, by Skype. Uh, and uh, to my uh, 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 somewhat surprise and uh, uh, and pleasure, uh, it was uh, successful. But then following that, there was an unexpected and unintended observations uh, that we uh, uh, learned about because parents uh, and, a Kate and a few adults uh, said that by watching the video, uh, the cough stopped. So this was suggestion therapy for hybrid cough by proxy. 
We published a brief report of it uh, back in 2019. And this was uh, the first one that I've got a record of. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing, uh, but I'll give you two, uh, some excerpts from it. Uh, so our daughter Riley is seven years old. Uh, a few months back, she had a really bad cold, which led to a bad cough, just like that 1694 report. After a few weeks, the cold symptoms went away, except for that cough. There was no stop to it, just so much coughing, and you've heard some of these. And uh, she went on, uh, obviously went to other doctors and describes all that, but she went on to say, I finally decided to just pull your video up on YouTube. And we all sat there and watched it. It was very emotional for all of us. And at the end, Riley was in tears. We all were. We hugged for a time. She said to us, I can hold the cough back. And then the coughing stopped, like turning off a switch. For four days now, I have not heard her cough, except for a few random ones here and there. The cough is gone. They're not all quite as dramatic as this one. Uh, uh, some of them take a few days of repeated watching of the video uh, and the feeling that they have to cough uh, can persist for weeks afterwards, uh, but they've learned to control it and they have stopped the repetitive coughing, which as I'll show you, uh, tends to make the cough cause be the cough of it, be the cause of the cough, that is. Uh, this uh, effect by proxy uh, has, uh, we've now got emails uh, from parents and adults from all over the world that have watched the video and told us that stopped the coughing. Uh, the red are the red drops are children, the blue are adults. Uh, the, I won't go into what the others are, uh, the, the pluses and stuff, but uh, uh, essentially from all over the world, at least the English speaking world, uh, they've watched the video and uh, uh, Dennis has arranged for uh, my patter uh, in the video uh, talking to Bethany to be translated into Macedonian, Spanish, German, Turkish, and Mandarin Chinese. I don't know how many of those are watched. We don't have that information. We only have the ones where they got back to us with an email. Now, what happens if you don't treat them with suggestion therapy? Well, this is from Mayo Clinic. Uh, it was stimulated by seeing my 1991 report. Uh, and uh, this was at the uh, North Central Allergy Society that the Mayo Clinic and our, us and others in the North Central US uh, uh, joined. And they, uh, uh, Dr. Rojas was a fellow and was asked by Dr. Yoder and O'Connell, essentially my uh, uh, the equivalent of me at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and uh, they, they went back and they found uh, those where the diagnosis had been made using the same criteria that we had, uh, but there was only explanation and counseling, no specific treatment. They had a follow-up of 62 patients, uh, somewhat of a male predominance for a mean of eight years back, looking at records. Ages were same as we had, and the mean cough duration until the diagnosis was made was eight months prior to being seen, and the mean duration of spontaneous resolution in 46 of them was six months, and 16 patients, 25 patients, were still coughing a mean of six years from the time of diagnosis. At the Brompton, they also made the diagnosis the same way we did, as I mentioned earlier, uh, but only explanation was uh, counseling and uh, explanation and counseling was all that was done. They were able to, fo to get uh, uh, follow-up of patients in 39 of the 55. We don't know anything about the rest of them. 
the median duration of their follow-up was 1.9 years. Uh, 26 of the 39 uh, parents believed the diagnosis and 25 of the 26 eventually resolved. Uh, about half of them in the first month, uh, but some of them not until after six months. But 13 of the 39 parents disbelieved the diagnosis. They wouldn't accept it. And seven of those resolved only after a longer period. And uh, at least during the period of follow-up, uh, the others had not yet resolved. Do we have a physiologic explanation for the cough? There's two studies that are interesting. Uh, one, we know in, in the vast majority of the cases, there's an initial insult, generally a history of a respiratory infection uh, that apparently is causing inflammation. And there was this study done by Richard Irwin in 15 years ago, uh, where he did on adults with chronic uh, idiopathic cough, uh, did a prospective controlled comparative study published in chest, and I won't go into the details of it, but he did conclude that the repetitive coughing and the inflammation was caused by the repetitive coughing. So that was his explanation. The cough was, had caused the inflammation. And then there was a study that uh, I don't think it's yet in print. It was uh, online in advance of print the last time I looked from the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical, uh, Critical Care Medicine. Uh, who also did biopsies, uh, mucosal biopsies of adults. Uh, these were done through bronchoscopy, obviously. Uh, and what they found was that there was uh, uh, increased uh, nerve density in the mucosa. And his explanation for that was the cough was the cause of this. The repetitive cough was the probable cause of these were hypotheses. So essentially, you put those together and you have neuropathic inflammation, which is caused by repetitive coughing. And that's that continuous feeling that is that causes the repetitive coughing, uh, a vicious circle. So now Charlie Brown knows what to do. Okay, that's uh, the data has been there. So the habit cough recap is uh, identify habit cough by its unique presentation, not by excluding everything else under the sun that causes cough, but it has a unique presentation. It's a clinical diagnosis, repetitive dry cough, absent during sleep. Treatment is suggestion therapy. There might be various types. People may have different styles, uh, but uh, th this has been done now by physicians uh, 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 elsewhere uh, in uh, Dr. Mantini in, in uh, Argentina has described it. Uh, physicians in uh, physician in Bristol, England has described it. And uh, uh, a particular uh, uh, pediatric pulmonologist in South Texas who says uh, the habit cough is uh, the pediatric pulmonologist nursemaid's elbow, if you're familiar with that disorder, and that both involve cures, rapid cures with no medication uh, and uh, are very satisfying both to the physician and the patient. Uh, so the treatment today is uh, suggestion therapy by the physician or more and more often it's by proxy. Uh, and there are prolonged symptoms if not treated. So moving on now to other causes of uh, functional respiratory disorders. Uh, dysfunctional breathing includes vocal cord dysfunction, hyperventilation, functional dyspnea, habit sighing. So let's look at vocal cord dysfunction. Back, historical background of this is, uh, it was at one time described as uh, hysteria. Uh, another, uh, and uh, then Dr. Osler uh, described uh, the, physiologically that there was laryngeal muscle with inspiration at times of great stress. There are two phenotypes of uh, 
the uh, VCD that have been described. Uh, one of the first uh, publications uh, in modern times uh, was in the New England Journal of Medicine in 1983. Five patients with a diagnosis of intractable asthma were found not to have just asthma, uh, but they had paroxysms uh, of wheezing and dyspnea that responded to speech therapy. Uh, and then there was a subsequent study looking at the other phenotype, uh, vocal cord dysfunction masquerading as exercise-induced asthma. Seven elite athletes, symptoms occurred only during exercise. Now, I don't know why people confuse them because when you look at them, they are opposites and they don't resemble each other. And it's people not just not paying careful attention when they see the patient uh, or they obtain a confusing history uh, and haven't really seen the patient. I want to show you a couple of examples. Uh, this is a 15-year-old uh, girl with three weeks of what was called wheezing and dyspnea. First episode, episode occurred while detasseling. Uh, those not from the Midwest, uh, what detasseling is, it's a Iowa adolescent summer job to create hybrid corn by ensuring cross-pollination. Uh, they could make good money in a few weeks' work. She had a second episode the next day while detasseling, same treatment, same result. And we subsequently found that she had uh, uh, a large positive skin test to corn pollen. Uh, corn pollen is uh, corn pollen doesn't cover much, doesn't doesn't go much further than a hundred yards from the yard from the cornfield. Uh, so it's a, essentially an occupational disease. Uh, and, uh, but she was then having daily episodes without detasseling. She stopped doing that and without response to the epinephrine. Uh, symptoms both spontaneous and exercise induced. Uh, she was having some spontaneous episodes and also uh, she was a very active young lady and uh, it was interfering with exercise. Um, and she'd been treated, of course, as asthma, which she did have. Uh, so since this was exercise induced, we put her on a treadmill and uh, here's her pre-exercise uh, volume loop, quite normal. And here's post-exercise, at which time she's making that noise. It was an inspiratory noise. And what you're seeing here is uh, normal pre-exercise followed by uh, uh, flattening of the uh, inspiratory loop, diagnostic of extrathoracic airway obstruction. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so what you're seeing there was a paradoxical vocal cord movement with closure and inspiration, and that was consistent with, with what was seen in the, in the pulmonary function. Now here's another girl, Sarah J, 15 year old again. She had a one and a half year history of recurrent severe episodes of again what was called wheezing. Uh, multiple paramedic calls for emergency room visits. She was treated with, of course, for asthma, which she didn't have. Uh, she did several hospitalizations uh, and no consistent response to any treatment. So all we had here was the history of this. Uh, and um, uh, we were, uh, we decided uh, to perform bronchoprovocation to see if there's any evidence of asthma. And as we're laying out the syringes and the needles, she started, essentially her symptoms were reproduced uh, unintentionally, but uh, uh, fortunately it made the diagnosis. So uh, this is before, and before we started doing anything, just preparing to do bronchoprovocation, uh, and she started eating like that. Uh, and so she had severe flow obstruction on both inspiration and expiration. 
So again, uh, we took a look. So what you're seeing there is uh, the vocal cords are, you know, closed. Uh, she's breathing through a opening of maybe two millimeters. Uh, but I was trying to get a view of her vocal cords moving normally when she talked. Uh, the epiglottis kept flipping into the way. So uh, you'll just watch that for a minute and then we'll go on. Uh, the, uh, uh, we uh, looked at BCD and asthma uh, that uh, with again, my uh, Doshi is my fellow. Uh, the uh, uh, 49 total patients identified with VCD, uh, 41 had a prior diagnosis, diagnosis of asthma, which of course they didn't have uh, uh, 12 of the 41, 29%. Uh, we were able to confirm a diagnosis of asthma, but so they can be occurring concurrently. Uh, but uh, uh, obviously the symptoms that concerned them most were not asthma symptoms. So we looked at our experience, uh, 28 or 49 patients with VCD were successfully contacted uh, by uh, Dr. Doshi and uh, my fellow at the time. And the median time was after three years. So we had 17 with exercise induced vocal cord to function only and pretreatment uh, we uh, uh, found from review of the literature that we thought this was uh, vaguely mediated and that an anticholinergic hypertropia might stop it. We did observe that in four of five, these five patients, but we also used hypertropia in many patients, subsequent patients uh, where we did uh, observe efficacy. Nine had spontaneous VCD, like that second girl. Six attended speech therapy and all attained control of their symptoms. Uh, we had two with both, uh, like that first patient I showed you, had both spontaneous and exercise induced. Uh, and uh, the uh, hypertropia was effective or appeared to be effective. These were clinical observations, obviously not controlled clinical trials. So 16 of 17 with exercise induced vocal cord dysfunction were completely asymptomatic at the time of contact, which is an average of three years later. One of the 17 continued to use hypertropium uh, prior to vigorous exercise. Uh, all nine with only spontaneous vocal cord dysfunction were asymptomatic at time of follow-up. Uh, so the long-term outlook of this is good. Uh, one of the two with spontaneous uh, and, uh, and exercise induced remained symptomatic one and a half years after evaluation, uh, but primarily with exercise and controlled with uh, hypertrophy. So the diagnosis of exercise induced VCD uh, is important, uh, not so much to distinguish from asthma, but the thing was distinguished because they're very different. Uh, any good clinician should be able to tell the difference. Uh, but uh, the uh, uh, need to distinguish them from other causes of exercise induced dyspnea. And next to do that, you need an exercise test. You need to reproduce the symptoms, determine what's going on physiologically at those times. Uh -huh. So that's essentially the kind of hookup they had, uh, monitoring uh, uh, both respiratory and cardiac uh, physiology at the time they reproduced their symptoms. The diagnosis we came up with with a series of 117 patients uh, that went through this uh, was, uh, uh, we did find exercise induced bronchospasm in 11% of those, sorry, 9% of those. Uh, Vocal cord dysfunction was also in only 11%. Um, 
there was restrictive phenomena in 13%, which we don't have time to go into right now. Uh, Exercise-induced lurgomalacia occurred in 2%, and exercise-induced hyperventilation occurred in 1%, and uh, exercise-induced uh, ventricular tachycardia in a 16-year-old boy with no palpitations. He only had dyspnea when he had uh, the VTAC, and that was subsequently fixed. Uh, the others were overinterpretation of these uh, adolescents uh, of uh, normal physiologic limitation. Uh, they just had normal uh, 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 lactic acidosis uh, that they would try to compensate the, the, the physiologically with uh, 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 respiratory alkalosis by breathing more and blowing off CO2. But they're asked to do that at a time when they're already at maximum minute ventilation. And that's interpreted by them as uh, being short of breath. Real quickly, uh, in the last couple of minutes, I'm going to go through uh, hyperventilation. Uh, and of course, we know what that is. It's often associated with a panic attack. The symptoms are not respiratory. The symptoms are uh, anxiety, dizziness, tingling and numbness of the fingers, toes, carpopedia spasm. And uh, this is respiratory alkalosis. And they have a decreased PCO2 from the hyperventilation, uh, an increased pH. Uh, and a decrease in the free calcium, which is what causes all the symptoms. So the symptoms are not primarily respiratory, uh, and that's important in diagnosing it, especially if you're not seeing it. You have to ask those questions. How do you treat it? Acute treatment is the old rebreathing bag. Uh, which uh, increases the PCO2, essentially reverses everything, decreases the pH down to more normal levels, and results in uh, correction of the free calcium. And that's what eliminates the symptoms. If they've been having this repeatedly, then of course they need education and counseling. Uh, nice study of 44 children at uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, with hyperventilation. Uh, uh, Girls tended to be more common than boys. Uh, and uh, there was a follow-up uh, of uh, 30 children uh, of, with hyperventilation, uh, also from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, and these are the symptoms they had afterwards, two to 28 years later, uh, among 30 children. Again, this is children who just had a single episode of hyperventilation. These are obviously children who had gone to Mayo Clinic because they're having it repeatedly. Uh, and there was a very high frequency of uh, many ongoing problems uh, years later when they were uh, uh, examined, uh, when they were followed up. Okay, going on to one more functional dyspnea. This doesn't take much time, essentially. These are children uh, who uh, are uh, breathing maybe somewhat rapidly, but not deeply. Their minute ventilation is generally normal. Their oximetry is normal. Their PCO2 is normal. And essentially, these are anxiety symptoms. They say, I'm having trouble breathing, uh, but physiologically, they're not. And there's one more, habit sign. Interesting phenomena, uh, multiple studies in the literature with it. Uh, it's intermittent deep breath. When asked, the patient may express a feeling that they feel they need more air, uh, but this is a completely benign disorder, uh, concerns parents more than the child, uh, but I've had them come to the clinic because uh, the parents are concerned. Uh, and the treatment is reassurance of the parents and benign neglect. So the take home message is uh, cough and dysfunctional breathing can occur in the absence of anatomic or physiologic medical explanation. Habit cough has a repetitive pattern absent once asleep as the cynic one on. Two phenotypes of vocal cord dysfunction, exercise induced and spontaneous. 
hyperventilation, often associated with panic attacks, and generally anxiety induced. Uh, symptoms are from respiratory alkalosis. And exercise induced dyspnea, if not asthma, requires cardiopulmonary te testing uh, for a definitive diagnosis. Don't just assume that exercise induced dyspnea that is not asthma is vocal cord dysfunction because most of them are not. Uh, functional dyspnea with no abnormal physiology is purely subjective and habit coughing, habit sighing is benign. So uh, these are uh, my colleagues, uh, Bethany, who was the first person who had suggestion therapy uh, by uh, uh, video, pro by video uh, conferencing. This is uh, Dennis, who is with us today, uh, her mother, uh, her twin brother, and her younger brother. And um, that's all for today. Do we have time for any questions? Hi, this is Andrew Colleen. I'm not sure that we have time for questions, but I have to follow on on uh, Tassos's introduction. Um, so it's wonderful to see you here. And I want this group to understand that we're looking at the paradigmatic academic physician who has done uh, to this field probably more than most. And, you know, I have to uh, give a personal angle to this. Um, Dr. Weinberger was known as Mr. Theophylline in the early days of modern treatment of asthma. He really knew everything about it. Uh, I, he came to Haifa, Israel when he was giving grand, talk, grand grounds in Cairo to interview me for a future fellowship that never happened because of ECFMG. And he was my first visiting professor. It's really refreshing and wonderful to see you here so many years later. So thank you for a great talk. And I do have a question. For this oh. habit cough that, that, um, that is so common and so quote unquote, easily fixable. What's the background is I am married to a psychiatrist who would ask you, so what's the driver? What's behind it? Uh, why is it so easy to, to make go away if it's persistently there? Is there, is there an explanation? Uh, of course, that's the study that yet needs to be done. Uh, I can give you clinical impressions uh, from myself and my colleagues who, who dealt with this in Iowa. Uh, the, uh, we've had the persistent impression uh, that these are you know, bright, sensitive kids. Uh, the, uh, uh, is, is, is that an explanation or is that just an explanation of the parents who bring the kids to us? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, I have, uh, uh, you know, we, we've had a few, I've had a few kids since here in, in California that, I've, uh, that had uh, uh, contacted with the parents uh, uh, that had autism, uh, the, uh, that had chronic cough. Uh, it, it's something that I think needs to be looked at. Uh, in other words, we, we know more about the pathology now, this vicious cycle uh, of um, uh, coughing causes inflammation, which causes coughing. Uh, we uh, don't know what starts it. Uh, we know there's a respiratory illness. Is it the nature of the respiratory illness? Is it different than others? We don't know. Or is it the personality of the patient that in some reason uh, makes them prone? Uh, from the uh, uh, limited studies that we did uh, uh, back on our 1991 article, uh, we couldn't uh, identify, at least from the standardized testing that was done, uh, there was no signal there of any uh, uh, disorder. Uh, one patient had this, you know, borderline high uh, uh, on the obsessive compulsive scale, but even that was you know, borderline, the, whatever the units were, over 70 was a, on, on that test was considered abnormal. 
and this did had a 70 uh, when it wasn't over. Uh, so I don't know, that's a good question. Uh, is there some personality quirk that makes that happen? But they don't go on and get, at least most of them don't go on and get other uh, somatic disorders. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, what does your wife think? Well, I never had this discussion with her, but uh, I'm assuming that I would present her this talk. She would say, so what's the explanation? Has any of these kids ever become a, a Tourette syndrome? No. Um, and one interesting story, um, there was a father uh, who had, as he said, mild Tourette's, but he had the full thing. He had the, the vocalization and all that. And his son also had it. Uh, he had, you know, vocal bursts, you know, tip and uh, some uh, motor uh, tics. Uh, and he developed a habit cough. Uh, and uh, he responded, uh, let's see, I think, yeah, I think he was one who responded uh, to proxy by watching the video. And the father said, that cured the cough, didn't have any effect on the Tourette symptoms. Interesting. Thank you. So he, the father's opinion, who seemed like a very intelligent guy, uh, was that these were totally separate. Oh, unfortunately, you know, often what we have is anecdotes here uh, that raise questions, uh, but uh, yeah, there are obviously answers. I would very much interested in what your wife's opinion of this. <laughs> I will. I will present. I will present the recording to her and ask whether she has an opinion. I, I have okay. to say, though, well, that, you know, uh, obviously the methodology that you are presenting here is, is amazingly, amazingly interesting uh, and because we are struggling with this. If I can uh, interject a little, um, one of the things that I have found, um, uh, you know, useful when I talk to the uh, parents and the patient uh, and try to make them understand what I'm talking about with the habit call. And, uh, you know, most of them, uh, you know, have the, uh, you know, the problem that uh, is my child faking? Uh, is it, uh, quote unquote, in his head? Uh, you know, all of these problems. So I tell them, you know, that yes, actually, it's one of the few things that uh, you are absolutely right that it is in your head because it is your brain that tells you to cough whether you need to do it or not. And what I give them as an example is um, something that everybody has experienced in the good old days, you know, going to a theater or a movie theater and one person coughs and then all of a sudden the entire room starts coughing. <laughs> and it is very obvious.